Thanksgiving season. And to you? We still have sunny days here in Colorado, but um, the holiday is just two weeks out from today. So I really love this program. I think this is going to be such a fun opportunity for people to see kind of the different approaches you can take when you're picking wines to pair with your Thanksgiving meal. And we've got some really great wines picked out to show everybody. So we're going to start out with sparkling, then we'll go to our higher acid bright whites, then Chardonnay, Rosé, Pinot, and big robust red wines. Yes, and sparkling. You know, what better way to start any sort of celebration, whether it's, uh, you know, you on your own or whether you're hanging out with your family and trying to make things work um, during Thanksgiving, than to start out with sparkling wine. And I have chosen this delicious sparkling wine from Warris Hubert. These guys are true champagne based in Champagne. They're in the village of Avis, which is a Grand Cru village in an area called the Cote de Blanc. Now, that area is known for Chardonnay, and this one is 100% Chardonnay. Um, the, the two people that came together to create this wine are um, Stephanie Hubert and, and Olivier Warris. Now, they're both fourth generation um, in that village and, you know, must have met each other over a glass of champagne in the vineyard or something. Hard, hard to know. Um, but they came together, they got married, and then they uh, started this domain. So pretty cool little story there. And um, this wine is called Lily Ale. Maybe you can see that right there. And that means very pure, white, very clear. Now, if you're looking at this wine, it is certainly pure. Um, and it's not exactly white, but it's about as close as you're going to get when you're, when you're making Chardonnay. Um, so it's, like I said, it's 100% Chardonnay, um, all from Grand Cru villages, including Avis, where they, where they were born and grew up and met each other. Um, it's aged on the leaves for about 18 months to add some complexity, some depth, some texture. Um, it's vegan, by the way. So if, if you have people in your family that um, have those uh, needs, then, then this one will, will certainly fit the bill. And, and it's also bottled with zero dosage. So if you haven't heard that term before, um, basically, the dosage is the amount of, of sugar. It's a mixture of sugar and wine that often right before bottling will be added to a champagne, um, not to add sugar to make it sweet, but champagne's so high in acid that it's added to kind of balance out the acid that inherently exists in champagne. Now, most commercial examples, you'll see brute on the label um, or even extra dry sometimes. And brute can be up to 12 grams per liter residual sugar. In this one, this is zero dosage, which means they don't add anything. So there's no sweetness whatsoever here. It is just the, the dry, beautiful, um, kind of lemony, citrusy, yellow apple, fresh minerality that you get from here without any of that kind of buttressing from the sugar. Now, the reason I love this for any celebration, and especially Thanksgiving, is that um, it is so refreshing and so effervescent and so dry um, that a, a, the dryness, um, you know, you're not filling yourself up with sugar before the meal, which is great. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic aperitif. You can hand this to people as soon as they walk in the door. It's celebratory. Um, and then as far as how it goes with food, um, champagne loves eggs. So if you have things like, like appetizers, um, you know, like, a, like deviled eggs or like a mini quiche, um, that, that acidity, that effervescence will cut right through that character. And it also works really well with uh, creamy cheeses like, like brie. You know, that's a common one that you'll see as kind of an appetizer. Um, Havarti will work too. Um, and then smoked foods too. So if you got like a smoked salmon or if you got like a smoked trout spread or something like this for appetizers, this is a great way to go. So if, if it's salty, if it's creamy, if it's eggy at the beginning of a meal, this is what you want. And like I said, make them happy when they come in the door and hand it to them. <laughs> yeah, you can't go wrong with bubbles when people walk in the door. So you went a really traditional route, grower champagne, meaning that the grapes are grown by the people that actually make the wine, as opposed to the, you know, very mass produced, very famous bottlings that we see around the shop. So you're getting a lot of bang for your buck in that. You went very classic on bubbles. I decided to go a little bit less traditional. So the sparkling wine that I chose is from uh, not Hubert, but Huber. Um, out in Tresenthal in Austria. So this is a really cool producer, family owned since the 1600s. They've been around forever. And I love this sparkling wine because, well, I love rosé and for pairing with a meal in particular because it's so versatile, it goes with everything. So this is a wine that you can actually drink. I know we think of champagne as an aperitif or as a place to start when you walk in the door, but a wine like this that has a little bit of skin contact and a little bit more body in the style, it's Pinot Noir and Zweigelt. Um, it's going to be something that you could actually drink throughout the whole entire meal. 
and it has a really nice acidity so it's lifted so it's going to help cut through the heaviness of the meal and the bubbles also kind of like help um you know when your stomach's getting super full you're going to have a really nice kind of relief from all that heaviness in the um in the in on the table or you could just have it when you walk in the door and i think what better way to start the day we're exactly two weeks out from thanksgiving so i'm going to go ahead and taste this wine as well um, as far as pairing this, you, I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, you're going to have like your cheeses. Um, I think even like an aged goat gouda could be really amazing with this, uh, triple cream brie, something like that. Um, it's fresh and lively and super fun. So there's definitely a big price difference between the wines that we chose. On this wine, you're going to be in like the mid teens, mid to upper teens price point. You'll see this uh, about like 15, 17 bucks. The wine you chose, which is of course, grower champagne is going to be more expensive. So yeah. Um, what's that sit on the shelf at? This one's going to be right around 60. But if you, if you think about, you know, some of the, first of all, this is Grand Cru Champagne. So this is the highest echelon you can get. Um, you know, the, things like Dom Perignon, some of these other famous, um, you know, Tete de Cuvées that are out there from Grand Cru and Premier Cru Vineyards. So this is Grand Cru Champagne for 60 bucks on the shelf, which is a ridiculous bargain, especially when you get things like the big name brands that I won't mention that are maybe right around that price point, maybe five bucks less. So you can spend about the same amount of money on something that's not Grand Cru or you can get the real stuff. And, and this for right around 60 is amazing. Totally, I appreciate that. So maybe that's, you start with that bottle and then you drink this like for the rest of the night. So, that is the way to do it. That is all true. right, well, let's go into our bright whites category. So this is for anybody who's like, we kind of made that term up, I think, or maybe not. But these are going to be the wines that people think of as like higher acid, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, things like that. They're going to be a little bit more um, like light as opposed to an oaky, buttery Chardonnay. So uh, what did yeah. you pick, Nathan? So, so this one is from the beautiful Mosul region of Germany. If you guys haven't been there, you got to go. It's storybook. It's, it's gorgeous. All these fantastic little bucolic vill villages and, and the, these steep slate slopes. It's a wonderful place to be. Um, so this one is from Selbach. So Selbach uh, is the negotiant arm of Selbach Oster. So um, I'll explain what that means, but Selbach Oster is a family that's been in Germany in the wine business since the 1600s. So, you know, they've been around. And this, um, is, this is Riesling, right? And this is Riesling, yes. So quintessential Thanksgiving pairing wine. Yes, quintessential. Yes, it needs to be at every table, always on my table, hopefully on yours too. So this is this is dry Mosul Riesling, um, and Selbach Oster is one of the most revered estates in the Mosul. Uh, they're, they're negotiant wines, so instead of being called Selbach Oster, it's just called Selbach. Difference is that, that instead of, um, with their estate wines, they have total control and they own the vineyards. Here, they don't own the vineyards, they're leasing the vineyards, but they have control over how the viticulture works there. In some cases, some companies that have negotiant labels, they don't have that kind of control, but Selbach does here. So it's really high quality wine for the price, which by the way, is about 16, 17 bucks on the shelf. Um, but these are, you know, single site Rieslings from leased vineyards that are under their supervision. So that, that equals quality. Um, also, it's sustainably grown. Um, so you're getting high quality grapes, high quality vineyards, and you're getting kind of the classic, the, the, the green apple that always shows up in Mosul Rieslings. Um, Meyer lemon, apricot, and there's always that kind of underlying minerality. This is great um, for a Thanksgiving meal for, for a lot of reasons. I mean, Riesling has that kind of natural zesty acidity that will cut through a lot of things. Um, it's great with, with, with salty um, meats. I mean, so if you've got like a prosciutto-based appetizer, if you're doing ham, I mean, Riesling and ham or salty ham are a match made in heaven. Um, so, and, and it also goes well with, with things like salads or, or, or you know, asparagus or all things all that are kind of tougher wine. to pair sometimes. That's right. Yeah. And, and so, so Riesling, I mean, of all the white wines in the world, you know, Gruner Veltliner gets talked a lot about uh, and is being a great uh, versatile pairing match. And Riesling is, is right there neck and neck. So a really good choice. And, and so what did you have for your bright wine? I today? picked one of my favorite wines um, in the world. Uh, this is called Secateurs Chenin Blanc. And the reason why I love this wine so much is because I mean, the, I think the expression crowd pleaser gets a little overused, but in this case, it is so absolutely true because you can really put this on the table and the people that love Sauvignon Blanc, but not Chardonnay will love this. And the people that love Chardonnay, but not Sauvignon Blanc will love this. Um, so it's a dry Chenin Blanc and they call Chenin uh, like the chameleon grape because it can show up in so many different styles and it can even be sparkling and it can be super sweet all the way to a dry style like this one. But this one's dry and 
it has an amazing like body and texture that really gives you you know the best of both worlds as far as a balanced white so i would still say it's a bright white like higher acid and super lifted and gonna do a lot of great things for the flavors on the table but it still has it has a little bit more like look luxury in the body and it's such a cool producer second tours are the shears they use to trim the grapes off the vines in the vineyards um it's south swartland south africa sustainably grown dry farms the guy who makes these makes some of the finest wines coming out of south africa and what's super cool is they have all these tiers. So this wine's like mid-teens, just like the last one that I showed. But it's um, it goes all the way up to these really cool family, you know, level of wines that are really expensive. So you can get a, an incredible wine from this region with this expression of this awesome variety for not that much money. And it, it like Shannon goes with turkey. I mean, it really is the Thanksgiving wine it's one of them like really like riesling probably not thought of as classically as riesling or pinot but this wine is definitely going to work with everything and, and the other thing that's nice about this is you can find it a lot of places so the importer is broadbent selections you'll see it a, very widely distributed around the united states a lot of people might even recognize this label if you haven't tried it you really really should they also make a red wine under the secretary's label and um, if you weren't going to go the traditional route, I know this year is crazy and weird and we're just having like holidays at home or, or whatever. So if you're going to do something a little different, you could try like a pork chop or any kind of game, uh, fowl, duck breast, smoked salmon, something like that would be really, really fantastic with this wine. And it also just is great by itself. So you can't, you cannot fail. Cheese plate, super easy, screw cap. I love that one. So yeah, that, I'm a big fan too. That one's hard to beat. <laughs> so let's go a little classic now when it comes to white wines. Chardonnay, of course. Um, Chardonnay is the, the queen, as, it, as is Riesling, I suppose. Um, for the Chardonnay that I picked, I kind of stayed in that new world vein. I think that you're kind of going old world. I'm kind of going new, which is cool because, you know, old world, for those who don't know, it's, it's Western Europe. New world, pretty much everything else. So these are some wines that are like coming from different regions. You got South Africa, you have Austria, which was uh, old world, but for a very classic Chardonnay opportunity, I brought the Frank family, Napa Valley, Carneros, Chardonnay. I absolutely love Frank family. These people are so amazing. It's such a great community. I got to go out and visit them earlier over harvest and it's the whole family's there. It's owned by Rich and Leslie Frank. He was a Disney executive for a long time. The winemaker Todd Graff is a genius and the fruit for this wine comes from Carneros. Um, the cooler part of the, of the, region um it, you know straddling sonoma and napa valley and this wine is like everything that a good chardonnay should be big a little bit of oak robust um layered it's it's like if you were cooking with butter it would lift the butter if you cooked with olive oil it would give you that buttery impression that you didn't get from actual butter so i love this wine and i know you have a chardonnay too and i'm dying to know what you picked because for me, this is like lobster mac, very traditional. It's a little <laughs> bit more expensive. It's gonna be like 32, 38 bucks on the shelf, but also pretty easy to find. So that's nice. And I also know that they're giving 15% of their uh, sales online in November back to um, supporting restaurants that are in jeopardy in this crazy pandemic that we're going through. So all around awesome people. I love this wine. And if you're looking for a super luxurious California Chardonnay, Frank Family Vineyards, what'd you pick? Love it and love Frank family. That that is a that is the quintessential Cali Chardonnay right there. So, I I went in a very different direction with this one, uh, about as um, opposing as you could be. I went with um, Albert Bichot's Chablis. So you know from from uh, more round, rich style in uh, California to the kind of marginal cool climate of Chablis in northern Burgundy. Um, big stylistic swing there. So. Um, you know, here you're 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 dealing with um, a wine that's done entirely in stainless steel, so there's no oak influence. It, it does spend about ten months on its lees to add a little bit of richness and texture, but that's kind of necessary when you've got a Chardonnay that's that's born of such a cool climate and, and can be so acid driven. Um, you know, a lot of citrusy flavors here, a lot of apple. You, you can almost sense that chalkiness in the wine. Um, but you know, the cool thing about Bichot is they're a fairly large house, but they have been a family owned, family run. Um, is state and negociant um, based in uh, Bonn in Burgundy since 1831. So again, they've been around for a while. It's the advantage of being in the old world, I guess, right? Um, but uh, and if you've never been to Bonn, oh my gosh, the cobblestone streets, the the amazing architecture, the Hospice de Bonn, it's just 
it's a good place to be also. And have a niswa salad. That's what I did, like for three days straight, just niswa salads. Um, and they're perfect with, with Chablis. But we're not talking about niswa salads unless you're planning on having that for Thanksgiving, in which case I applaud you. Um, but this wine um, is great for Thanksgiving with, with the classic <laughs> items like green bean casserole. If you've got mushrooms in there, that, that kind of earthiness in the Chablis will be reflected in, in, that, in that dish. Um, and again, this kind of acidity will, will, will kind of cut through the richness. Um, and then mashed potatoes, if, if you're not doing kind of the heavy style, if you're doing more like a whip style with butter and salt, I mean, then this is a match made in heaven. So um, I, I love this Chablis. It's very, it's kind of polar opposite of, of your style of Chardonnay. Um, but this one sits on the shelf usually between about, you know, 27 and 29.99. So still excellent and affordable and delicious and really works. Well, that's what's so cool about doing this type of thing is because you can get the same grape variety and have it show up in such different expression and be and be so different. So it's a cool thing. If, if you guys are curious about what that actually looks like, pick up one of each of these bottles. You can find both of them for the most part out in the shops around Colorado and taste them side by side and see how different they are and then try them with the meal and see how they work with the different flavors. This is how we get a little bit of entertainment. Um, especially since things are kind of downsized this year. You're not going to have quite as big of a gathering or any gathering at all. And if that's the case, just throw a straw in it and drink it by yourself and you won't even remember the problems you're having. So it's going to be a great <laughs> holiday no matter what. <laughs> Let's drink pink. Let's go to a rosé. All right. I love rosé for Thanksgiving. I love rosé all the time. I drink it year round. It's not a summer thing for me. But for Thanksgiving in particular, I feel like this is a food comedian. Chameleon. It may be both. <laughs> What'd you Rose pick? can be funny. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you pick for us? Well, so um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the people that own this property and I'm a big fan of the wine itself. So um, you guys have probably seen this one around the market, the Trien Rosé. It is fantastic. I mean, you, you can't beat it for the price. This is usually on the shelf between $16.99 and $19.99, depending on where you are. Um, Trien is, it's owned by that superstar burgundy duo um, that decided to come together and, and, and create this project. It's, it's the people behind Domaine de la Romani Conti, which is probably the most revered estate in Burgundy period of all time. And then Domaine du Jacques, which is, you know, right there. And we get um, this much du Jacques every year. We do. Yes. Just, just a little bit. It is, it's coveted and, and, you know, both producers are, are fantastic. Um, so they decided to, to start this project down in, in Provence. And, and Diana Snowden Sace, who, who is actually married to the owner of Domaine du Jacques, um, oversees production here too. So super cool, a family affair, you know, female winemaker um, and, and delicious stuff. They, they, they uh, harvest the grapes at night to keep them cool coming in so that there's integrity there. They don't have to worry about, about rot um, or, or, or other problems, oxidation especially. Um, this is mostly Cinso with a little bit of Grenache, some Syrah, and even some Merlot in here. So it's, it's fairly complex, really interesting. Um, and as far as flavors, I mean, you're getting aromas of white blossoms, um, orange pith, and that kind of fresh strawberry citrus zest. It's a very um, classic style, a dry style of Provencal Rosé, really brisk. Um, and, you know, speaking of the best of both worlds thing, uh, that's kind of what you get with Rosé. You know, you, you've, you've got some of the structure that you would have with a red wine, um, you know, a little bit of tannin in there, but it's excellent acidity and you can also chill it and most people do and kind of treat it like you would a white wine. Um, and so, you know, when I think of rosé for the Thanksgiving meal, I think that it, it pretty much is, is emulating what, what cranberry sauce does on your plate. So if you, if you kind of think about how that works, how cranberry sauce, you know, some people like my grandmother used to put a little bit of cranberry sauce in every single little bite and then try it out. You know, this is your cranberry sauce. This is your liquid cranberry sauce. Um, and, and, it, and it works especially well with, um, with stuffing because you've got these herbal nuances here and that kind of gets reflected in most people's stuffing as well. So um, in, impossible to beat as far as versatility, really delicious and a great pedigree. So uh, what did you pick for your rosé? I, again, went like very new world, straight to California. This is Banshee Rosé. Mm. So these wines are really cool too. They're in Sonoma. They, they are a negociant. So they buy grapes from different growers and make wines. A fantastic Pinot Noir. If you go out to their tasting room in Healdsburg, they have all these really cool single vineyard wines. They make great Chardonnay and they make this awesome rosé. Now they used to make the rosé out of Pinot Noir and it's, I'm very hit or miss personally with rosé of Pinot Noir. I love that they changed the blend on this. So now you've got um, 
Grenache, Barbera, and Syrah. So you have a little bit more of, a little bit thicker skins, a little bit more action. I'm sure that they're only letting the skins be in contact with this wine for a very, very short period of time because the skins of grapes are kind of like a tea bag with, with tea, you'd like dip it in and it's like gonna give it color right away. So when you get a nice light rosé like this, they're only gonna let that contact happen very briefly. But it's, it's, a, it's a fresh, fruity, um, you know, youthful style of wine. It, it pairs beautifully with all the things that you're gonna have on the plate. And I think that, again, speaking to like non-tradition, if you were gonna do something a little bit different for the meal, um, you could do like a lamb roast with like a little mm -hmm. bit of rare, like a little bit of pink on there, um, a feta spinach salad, something like that would be super, super good with this. And it is just such a fun producer. The guy started this this label in a bar in San Francisco with some of his buddies. And they basically procured a couple of barrels of this really, really fantastic Pinot Noir. And it just it just kept growing and turned into this really cool into this really cool brand. So Banshee Pin uh, Banshee Rose from Mendocino County and a really cool blend. Again, this is going to be like 20 to 25 bucks on the shelf. All right. That Rose is a good bridge from Sparkling to white to rosé, now we go into red wines. So, and here we are. Classic so as far as... quintessential red wine pairing for uh, for Thanksgiving is Pinot. You know, for my Pinot, I didn't choose Pinot. Oh! <laughs> Curveball! <laughs> so, yeah. So I um, I went with Chateau de Varenne uh, Beaujolais oh. Village. So You're a good man. You're a good man. Because no conversation about Thanksgiving should happen without Beaujolais. I'm a Beaujolais I, freak, uh, but I love these wines so much. So tell us about the wine you picked. Well, I, I, I agree with you and thank you. Um, so yeah, we had to have some Gamay in here, didn't we? Had to. Um, so Chateau de Varennes is, is a really old property. Um, it's at the southernmost tip of, of Beaujolais, just north of, um, of Lyon, which is uh, France's capital of gastronomy. So kind of, you know, that kind of works, that dovetails a bit. Um, it's been around since the 13th century. So again, a lot of history, you're in the old world. Um, and it's 100% Gamay, it's all done in stainless steel, so no oak influence here. And it's got that tart red fruit um, that you would expect, the raspberry, the red currant, the red cherry, along with those kind of fresh herbal nuances and just a hint of that kind of cracked black pepper. So, I mean, this is, if, if I had to choose one bottle to have with Thanksgiving, Ooh, maybe Riesling, but probably Gamay. Uh, hard Luckily, to say. you but never have to pick one bottle. <laughs> I'll bring two. I'll always bring two. I'll bring a Riesling and a Gamay. But um, but the you know this works with all sorts of stuff. I mean the the, the turkey, the the stuffing, the sauce. I mean the the inherent kind of fruitiness and zesty acidity that Gamay brings to the table. Um, it, it's it's kind of acting like that that cranberry sauce um, again, but uh, also that that light kind of spicy peppery quality. It. I mean, how much spice is on the Thanksgiving table? I mean, it, it's, it's in everything. It's in the gravy that you've got. It's in the stuffing. It's in, it's, you know, it's been on the turkey. It's, 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 it's all over the place. So it, this, this really works well to, to balance out all those things and complement all those things. And that's why I love it. And you, you can find it for almost nothing. I mean, it's like 14, 15, $16 on the shelf. It's, it's that's ridiculous. Stuff. Yeah. I love those wines. I actually like sticking my Beaujolais in the fridge. If it's like a really a crew Beaujolais, I probably wouldn't chill it. But um, I do like them on the cooler side, like not cold, but I kind of like to put them in the fridge and then pull them out before you open it and just like have a little, because it's such light, fruity deliciousness that it just, it just suits it, I feel. And it's always like a nice relief from the heavy meal. Yeah. So I did pick Pinot and I think this wine is so cool. This is the Hilt um, from uh, Matt Deese. He's the winemaker. He also makes the wines at Honada and The Pairing. And he is a super, super cool guy. He, he and I did an interview once where we paired his wines with different songs because he's a big music buff. And I think there's so much that wine and music have in common with each other. And there's, you know, there's feelings that you can evoke um, through a bottle of wine. And so this is the Estate Pinot from the Hilt. They are um, down in Ballard Canyon. So this is a really, really unique area. Um, they are making, he's planted all these different clones of Pinot Noir and he just lets nature do what it does. He's a very kind of like, hands off, uh, just kind of steering the river, you know, well, what type of winemaker. And you don't get a lot of oak influence on this. It's only about 10% new French oak and then 90% is going to be a neutral barrel. So it's not going to impart a whole lot of flavor. It's just more about rounding out the texture of the wine, softening the acids and keeping it nicely integrated. So 
when you get your, you know, similar to what you said about the wine behaving like a cranberry sauce, I think that was referring to the rosé, but I think that wine in general can very much act as a, as a seasoning for our, our meals when we're eating. So I, I'm someone who always wants to put a fresh squeeze of lemon on top of my food, try not to add too much salt, things like that. So wine can really add components that you might think about adding as like an actual ingredient. But um, this, you know, a Pinot is, it's so perfect because it's earthy. It's, it brings that spice. It really complements everything else that's going on. And again, you're gonna pay a little bit more for this bottle, it's about 45 bucks. But for estate Pinot Noir, it's awesome. And a lot of times you'll hear like, you should be able to read your newspaper through your Pinot Noir. This wine is a little bit more body in there. Like it's a lot of wine but it's still very elegant and refined. So that's something he does so well. Like, you know, this guy has some balls, but it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's not wimpy, right? But it's also not overpowering. So we're gonna get into the big bold reds next, but if you want something that's a little more elegant, refined, not overwhelming, this is gonna be an awesome selection. Yeah, totally. you know, you can read your newspaper next to your Pinot Noir. You don't have to read it through it, so. Nobody just... actually does that anyway. It's, it's, it's <laughs> so like, not important. It seems challenging, it'd be challenging. Um, so I, uh, so as far as the big reds, you know, for something a little bit less traditional, not everybody's having, uh, turkey or ham necessarily. So, uh, you know, with kind of an eye toward beef and prime rib, uh, for the big reds, I, I went with the textbook Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. So these guys, it's, it's, it's sourced from an array of different sites around Napa Valley. It's 92% Cab and 8% Merlot. And, and these are common blending partners, of course, going back centuries, um, kind of originated in Bordeaux. And, and Merlot brings a little bit of a, a base end to uh, Cabernet's uh, structure and um, some softness, a little bit of richness, and always complements well. Uh, about 30% of this was in New French Oak for about 16 months. So this is not a heavily oak style, even though it's from California and from Napa. Um, you know, the pendulum has been kind of swinging back away from super extracted, super oaky styles from Napa. And, and these guys are certainly um, on that on that path. It's also done unfiltered. So, you know, filtration, fining, any 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 sort of process like that can remove some character. So they decided not to do, do that here. And it's unfiltered as well. Um, so here you're getting that kind of classic ripe black fruit that you get in Napa. A lot of lushness, um, you know, cassis, black currant. Um, some dried herbs, some earthy notes, a little bit of cedar from that, that, you know, small dose of oak that we talked about. And like I said, this is for people that want a little something meatier for Thanksgiving. Um, you know, prime rib is kind of the quintessential example. And Cabernet and beef have a, a real affinity, as we know, um, especially if they're, if you, you know, the salt will act to kind of ameliorate tannin and that astringency in, in red wine. So, you know, if you, if you are doing the prime rib, you're probably going to put some salt on it you know, it, that, that salt is going to do the job to make this wine and, and allow its uh, fruitiness to kind of shine through. And this thing is so affordable for Napa Cab. It's unbelievable. I mean, this is usually right around 30 bucks, which is astounding for a high quality, you know, Napa Cabernet. So that's, that's my choice for the big reds. How awesome. You? I have a really big, big red to pick. But before I go on, I think I said for the Hilt that this was from Ballard Canyon. Honada wines are from Ballard Canyon. Same winemaker. This is Santa Rita Hills which would make a lot more sense for Pinot Noir. So um, <laughs> don't, get the, don't get the area wrong, it does matter, but that's another conversation. For my big red, I chose, I couldn't resist, Earthquake Zinfandel from Michael, uh, Michael David Winery out in Lodi, California. Um, yesterday, I read that this was awarded the American Winery of the Year by Wine Enthusiast Magazine. So that is a ridiculous accolade, especially for a winery that's in Lodi. Um, if you guys have heard of the freak show wines, a lot of people have seen those out in the market. Um, and they have these really fun arts, artistic labels. And I think a lot of times people associate that with being like this big marketing forward brand, but actually this is a family owned winery. They own their vineyards. They take massive strides to make sure that their wines are, um, taking care of the environment. They are, they fall under an organization called Lodi rules, which is a very stringent environmental, um, accreditation or certification in the area in Lodi. So it's a warmer climate. Um, you're gonna get these big, bold, robust, big wines. For Zinfandel though, you get a lot of old vines here. So these are like 50 to 100 years old vines. Um, the wine is just a big, big fruit bomb. <laughs> There's really no way around it. But a lot of us love that. And I think that it can be so much fun 
it's an interesting like comparison with some of the other wines we're talking about. We're getting into like Pinot Beaujolais. Those wines are light and they're gonna go with kind of everything and be more versatile. A wine like this is gonna really kick the pants off of certain dishes. So it can <laughs> overwhelm things a lot. But that being said, if you're gonna do something like, you mentioned prime rib, like my mom's prime rib just makes me go nuts for the holidays. Um, and we get it once a year and it's just the best thing ever. This would be so, so good with that or anything barbecued. I mean, Zinfandel like lives in the meat aisle I feel, but um, ironically, the wine is vegan, <laughs> as another one you mentioned. So, but this is such a great wine, and it's going to have like a lot of baked fruit characteristics, chocolate, some of that darker notes from from the oak regimen that it, that it sees. So, another great wine. Um, I I'm so in love with this these selections that we've made. I think that a lot of interesting characteristics and components and different ways to approach the same categories of wine. You can course these throughout the meal, or you can just pick one and commit and stay there for the whole time. But we all know that one bottle of wine never lasts the whole meal. So I say pick up at least three, make sure that you've got stuff on hand for these weird weeks ahead of us. And hopefully people are going to be able to safely gather, be with friends or family in some way. And if you can't just know that next year we'll make up for it and shit, we'll have Thanksgiving in February if we have to, we just make it work. So um, there's always great wine along the way. I'm so grateful to you for the time you spent with doing this with me, it's so fun. Anything else, Nathan? Happy holidays to everyone out there. And thank you, Montana. That was a lot of fun. That was Looking so fun. To thank time. you so much. I will see you soon.